it actually documents our history, our culture, the things that happened in the past and also for the future. And people think, well, how could art be a written language? Do comparisons. We're all human beings all over the world. You have the Egyptian hieroglyphics and the word hieroglyphics from the Greek, hieros glyphiros, sacred carvings. And they're only being deciphered now, still being deciphered, but they documented the Egyptian history all the way through. It's a written language in art. Similarity to that is South America, the Inca, the Aztec and the Mayan culture. Theirs is also an art form of hieroglyphics, which documents a history, which is still being translated. Uh, a little bit closer to us in Australia, we have the South Pacific. For instance, the Polynesian structure, of the Maori especially, the carvings, uh, the tattoos, we call moku, on the face and on the arms, on the body. They are also documenting their iwi or their clan groups, the whole structure of who they are and where they come from. So art is a written language, depending on the person who understands that art as a written language. Also, art documents our belonging, our belonging to the land, the importance of the land, because in Aboriginal culture, it's not just the land, it's what's on the land and in the land. We become as one with the land. So we understand the animals, the, the plants, uh, the birds, the fish, we have to know the whole structure. We know how they breed, how they migrate, where they live, time to hunt. So everything is a part of that whole structure that we have to understand. And so art helps document that whole history. Song lines can be very complicated. The word song lines comes from the English translation, obviously it's in English, song lines. In our culture, we understood the whole area where we lived, but also the structure of trade and ceremony. So you'd move from one piece of your where you belong to, to another clan group. And so you'd have to move through the land. So song lines are actually maps of the land. To give you an idea, you've got a, a group of say 100 people, men, women and children. They're living in an area, they're camping there, they go out hunting. The men go out looking for the emu, the wallaby, the kangaroo, and the fish and so forth. The women go out looking for the, the seeds and the wild fruits and things that they will use for cooking. And so what happens, as you're going out to hunt over a period of time, you have to go a little bit further. The animals get a little bit scarcer. Our culture, you do not destroy. So what would happen then, the warriors would report back, the women would report back it was getting scarcer and further to go to hunt and to gather their food source. The elders would come together, they'd have a meeting, and then they would decide it's now time to leave that area. You don't destroy it because it has to regenerate and regrow again. So we move on before we destroy it. And so they will sing of the land they're moving into. They'll sing of the rivers, the bend in the river, the rock formation, the trees, the food source that's found there. And the people knowing the land intimately, they know exactly where they're going. And as they're going along these tracks or song lines or maps of the land, they'd be singing of the earth because sacred areas, sacred places, things that have happened in the past. So they're singing and chanting all the way along and giving thanks to the earth, to the mother. The English see that and they see now people and they call them song lines because we moved around the land to protect the earth. We were natural greenies and ecologists.